Hello, welcome to the Paradigm Shift, episode 40, Navigating the Wilderness, Overcoming Temptation. I'm Apostle Matthew Shoemaker. We must walk through the wilderness to get to the promised land. <laughs> that sounds disheartening, doesn't it? It's not if we understand what the wilderness is leading to and why we walk through it. Before the promises of God for your life and purpose in His kingdom come to pass, there's a time of testing that we traverse through. During the journey, there's temptation to become fearful and turn back. This is the test of walking in faith. Who will you obey in the moment of pressure in the wilderness? Join me in exploring the journey of faith that passes through the wilderness en route to the promised land. Now when I'm talking about promised land, see you have the pattern of the Israelites that came out of slavery to Egypt, went through the wilderness, and established the kingdom in the land that God had promised them. Well, okay. Now there is corporate understanding of this, doing this as a body, a church, in establishing the kingdom on the earth, the kingdom of God, in the spirit. But there is also application to you personally. And that's what I'm focusing on right now in this lesson. See, when you decide, I'm not going to be a slave to worldly culture anymore. Then you, <laughs> first there's God's shaking that delivers you or uh, yeah, delivers you from slavery. Then you traverse through the wilderness. Well, people hear that word wilderness and it is true. There are things that are uh, unestablished there. <laughs> there are dangers in the wilderness. But just exactly like God followed the Israelites and protected them with his presence, he was the pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke to protect them. See, that's walking in faith in your life. When you launch out with God and you trust that he's going to protect you because the blood of Jesus bought your victory. You see. That's not living by the natural eye, by what your natural eyes see, but that's living according to the instruction of the Spirit. And the Israelites would encamp when God told them to encamp, and they would move when God told them to move. And so we need to learn to follow God's voice in our own personal life in that way. When God tells you to do something, you do it, and when He says, stay here and wait, you wait for God's instruction, you see all the time remaining at peace because he will never leave you or forsake you. And so, what is the purpose of the wilderness? Well, is it just some torture device? <laughs> no. No. See, when the Israelites came out of slavery, they weren't ready to establish a kingdom yet. But that's where God was taking them in the future. They had to learn how to obey God. That's part of God's kingdom, you see. Many times we think of obeying God in a certain way, but when we get under pressure, we don't obey Him, you see. And the wilderness puts people in situations where their faith is going to be tested. And so that's what the wilderness is. In your life, when you leave worldly culture, people think, oh, it's just drudgery. No, your reliance, he, he, he's actually breaking your reliance on yourself, so you'll rely on him. That's the point. So, <laughs> faith does what God tells you to do, and not what your own flesh wants to do. That's the testing. The tests come until you overcome the flesh by the blood of the Lamb. And then the kingdom is established. 
then you are given a testimony in that process. So, <laughs> when you go through the wilderness in your own life, just exactly like the Israelites, there's going to be temptations to quit. <laughs> Satan's going to come and say, what have you done? You just need to go back to doing things the way you did them before. That's exactly what the, he did to the Israelites. Some of them even got together at one point and uh, considered going back to Egypt to be slaves. See? He's going to come at you with this, be fearful, turn back. Don't do it. That's the test. See, that's the thing you're supposed to overcome. You're supposed to obey the voice of God and not the, the voice of the enemy. That's what you're overcoming, you see. So in this process, you learn how to demonstrate and walk in your devotion to God. Not just say it with your mouth. Say that you are devoted to God and all those things. No, to actually be devoted to God. When the enemy comes and tries to get you to do something else, you say, no, I'm not following that path. I'm going to do what my father said. You see, that's what we're learning to do in the wilderness. And it was a 40-year journey. Now, there's this number 40 <laughs> that's tied to the concept of testing, you see. Yes, number 40. They walked around 40 years in the wilderness, which it wasn't a 40-year trip, see. They had to learn to obey. And those that wouldn't obey, God removed them in the process, see. There was a generation of people that didn't actually make it to the promised land, not because it wasn't possible, but because they hadn't gotten all of Egypt out of them. That's what it was. And so you have to get all the worldly culture out of you to establish the kingdom. The Israelites had moved about in the wilderness 40 years until all the men who were military age when they left Egypt had died. Since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land he had solemnly promised their ancestors to give us a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. Joshua 5 through, <laughs> Joshua chapter 5, 6 through 8, NIV. Now we need to understand what circumcision of the flesh is. Now, of course, there was natural circumcision of the flesh, which was cutting some skin off. But why would God tell them to do that? Well, he's giving us deeper, that's why he included it in his word, the Bible that's available to us today. There's a deeper understanding of circumcising of the flesh that we can apply to our lives today. When you are acting in such a nature that is uh, fleshly, you have to cut off the flesh to establish God's covenant. Amen? So what God is doing is in the process of making his covenant promises come to pass in your life, he, <laughs> he removes your excess flesh with the sharpness of his word. So we need to learn to obey the spirit and not the flesh. So these people... They had not been circumcised in the wilderness. And so Joshua, which is uh, a derivative, if not just another way of pronouncing the word Yeshua, which is Jesus. They, they are Jesus, Joshua, and Yeshua all come from the same word. So they're just different pronunciations in different cultures, etc. So Joshua had to circumcise the people. 
So in this, once you go into the wilderness experience and journey there through it, you have to make up your mind that you're not going back to living under the rulership of the flesh. Cut it off completely. And, but my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in one who shrinks back. Hebrews 10.38 NIV. So there's that thing about turning back. Once you go into the wilderness, you can't turn around and go back to the world. If you do that, it's going to cause you problems. Major problems. And so what happened to Lot's wife is because she kept looking back behind her toward what she was leaving, Sodom and Gomorrah, she was leaving an ungodly culture and she kept looking back to it. And what happened to her is fear caused her to turn to salt. Now, she physically turned to salt, yes, but you, you today, have to learn how to operate in the fear of the Lord and the fear of nothing else. The only thing you should fear is disobeying God. And then once you do that, you don't have to fear anything else. You obey God and nothing else can touch you, can touch your soul, see. You don't let anything else control your life. And so what Lot did was she turned around and looked behind her and was turned to salt. Now, why do I equate salt with fear? Well, we know that Lot's wife was filled with fear. That's number one. Number two, salt is in the ocean. If you drink ocean water, it'll kill you. So fear speaks of something. Now, you're supposed to have the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. But if you have the salt that is not the fear of the Lord, you have the salt that is the rulership of the flesh where you fear circumstances. You fear your future because you have no faith. That turns you into a pillar that cannot move. In other words, you ever seen a person that was so stricken with fear that they couldn't move? That's what it does to you spiritually. Fear stops you from taking steps of faith. That's what it does. And so that's why turning back and looking behind you is useless. Once you set out with the Lord, the Lord is in control and you keep your eyes on Him and His face and He will lead you straight to where you need to go. <laughs> now we have this thing where uh, the number 40, I've told you it's associated with testing. And as a general theme, we're talking about traversing the wilderness and enduring temptation here. And so Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the Son of God, command these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Matthew 4, 1 through 4, NIV. Interesting. I, I've talked about this briefly before, but Jesus is going into the wilderness because the Spirit took him there. See, it's the Spirit of God that leads him to the wilderness. Oh, why would God take us into the wilderness? It's in route to your promise. See, Jesus had to go through this time in his life before he was established as Lord of the universe. You see. He, <laughs> his covenant promise of having a bride that he bought with his own blood came to pass. But he had to be tested to see whether or not he would obey the devil. See, the process that Jesus went through is the same process that you and I have to go through, only uh, spiritually. 
spiritually. You don't have to be crucified on a physical cross. But Satan is going to come tempt you. When you decide to live your life by faith and to follow God's plan for your life, saying, not my will, but yours be done, Lord, Satan is going to try to get you to obey him, just like he did Jesus. He tempted Jesus. Satan's going to come and say, oh, what about fear? You're so hungry. What a, why don't you just obey me? Just this one little compromise. Every time. It needs to be what God said that comes out of your mouth. No, God promised me this. I'm not listening to that crap. You see? So that's what Jesus did. The word of God came out of his mouth every time the enemy tried to tempt him. You see? We need to get the promises of God in his word, yes, and the promises individually that he gives to you. See, he tells you what your promised land looks like. He told them it was a land flowing with milk and honey. He'll tell you your promise looks like this. A successful uh, business but one that does not operate according to the culture of the world but the culture of the kingdom see that's the type of thing God has for his people if we will have the faith to launch out and come out of slavery go through the wilderness and establish the kingdom he's waiting for his warriors to rise up and do this so, <clears throat> you're going to be tempted to see who you will obey. Well, when it gets too hard, all you have to do is keep going back. Jesus loves me. You see, that is the rock that cannot be shifted. That's the chief cornerstone that uh, you build your house on. Don't build it on shifting sand. Build it on the rock that cannot be moved. You see, Jesus paid for your victory in his own blood. That truth cannot be undone by anything that the enemy does. Nothing. Jesus bought it. Bought and paid for it. And so what's being tested here is your reliance upon that. Are you relying upon yourself or upon the blood-bought victory? Do you have faith in the sacrifice of Christ and who he is for you? Or do you have faith in your own abilities, your own logic, your own wisdom? That's the thing that's being worked out of you in the wilderness experience. Through testing, we are tested until we pass. <laughs> Just don't quit. <laughs> that's the only thing. You get all that flesh worked out of you in the process. You're circumcised of your flesh nature. And then you can live according to the Spirit just like Christ. There's another aspect of this, this testing of 40 thing. Well, we can see that the wilderness is uh, not established. It's uncomfortable for us at times because what we're coming out of is reliance upon ourselves. Now, the comforter is always with us. But what we have to do is learn to rely upon the comforter in testing instead of on ourselves. That's the practical purpose of wilderness experiences is coming out of self-reliance. You see. Now, a woman, <laughs> this is God's creation and his creation testifies of him. A woman is pregnant for 40 weeks. Now, I know there's some little small nuances and all that, but generally it's a 40 week process. And so <laughs> that's not accidental. <laughs> that's God. And so uh, when you're being delivered, see, you're coming out of something into newness of life. That's the pattern. And so there's a uh, testing under pressure, and there's one point during that process, it's really difficult until you break through. That's coming through the wilderness. So you learn not to rely on yourself, but to rely on the Spirit of God. 
you see that's when the enemy cranks up the, t the pressure when he cranks up the pressure in your life it's like the child being birthed in a natural mother process when he cranks up the pressure on your life as you are spiritually walking toward your promised land you're about to get your breakthrough that's why the pressure is being turned up <laughs> yeah Satan gets in panic mode you see gotta stop it gotta stop it <laughs> but you have to realize that he, he can't help himself and he can't stop you either <laughs> He can't help but to come at you. He can't help himself. He doesn't have that self-control in him. He doesn't have any. But when he comes at you and tries to put the pressure on you to relent and turn back and tries to make your destiny an abortion, you hear me? See, when, when you're about to break through, don't turn back. The promise dies you gotta go on through <laughs> and so when you're about to break through in life what you do when the enemy just comes at you you just let go of all the flesh and I'm not listening to you man <laughs> and that's what God does through that process we think that God's being cruel no he, he's getting us to be so reliant upon him that Satan's got no chance. No chance. And so, what freedom? We, we need to understand what God is doing for us. We, we feel like, oh, this is so hard. This is so hard learning not to rely on myself. God's freeing you from what screws your life up. <laughs> He's teaching us to rely upon Him totally. And when we do that and we learn to make our decisions in life based on Jesus, the Spirit. <laughs> when we learn to do that, then failure becomes something unfamiliar. <laughs> so that's what that's the process. He is getting you to where you can rely on the Spirit totally. And instead of getting your own results or the world's results, you get the results of God. That's when all these great, magnificent promises come to pass. Because we learn not to rely on ourselves or on our own flesh. But we rely on the Spirit of God. And so, when you come to this place where you're like, I, I'm ready I'm ready to leave the culture of the world and to go after God's promise for my life. At first, you may not even know what your promise is. I didn't. I just knew that when I stepped out with the Lord to do things in such a way that was uh, <laughs> abnormal, <laughs> you first step out in faith not knowing where God is taking you see that gets to God's attention he says there's faith you see God responds to faith we in a Christian culture call things faith that are not faith going to sit in a pew is not faithful it's just sitting in a pew it takes no faith in God to sit in a pew it's what you do with what you learn in church that determines whether or not you're operating in faith. See, being righteous, you are not righteous because you go to church or listen to a message. Do you take God's word and apply it in steps of faith? That's coming out of religious culture and moving into following the voice of God. Saying, this is the way, walk ye in it see we don't understand that in the majority of Christian culture we think we're righteous because we go and sit and listen to a message but the practical application is missing as Christians we have to begin to apply the Word of God personal personal what you do with what God gives you 
is important to God. It matters. And so when you launch out into this traversing through the wilderness, understand that the presence of God is with you the entire time. And you can actually use that wilderness experience to take your relationship with God to a whole new level. And that's actually what he's doing. He's teaching you to hear his voice for yourself and obey. And so the wilderness experience, while the flesh says, no, I don't want to do that, that's scary. The spirit says, I have a destiny for you. Do you want it? <laughs> How bad do you want my promise? So some people are going to see this video and there's going to be some promises stirred up in you. God's going to send you some invitations that say, do you want to launch out with me? Do you want to be a part of what I'm doing on planet Earth? What a precious invitation. I encourage you to accept. Because although there have been times of difficulty, I can say every step of the way has been worth it because my relationship with the Lord has been supercharged by what He's done for me. His ways are higher than our ways and His thoughts higher than our thoughts. But what we need to understand about it, that is, His ways are good. He's got a good purpose in mind. He's doing something that we need so bad. <laughs> He's helping us with the problem that we can't solve on our own. And that's self-reliance. You have to learn to cut the flesh off and rely upon God's Spirit. And in birthing your promise, you go through the wilderness. And at the very end, there's great pressure to relent. Don't give up. Don't give in. Break through to your promise. Break through to your promise. That is a great test of faith, whether you're going to obey God or obey all these voices in your head that wants to quit, turn back, don't do it, stop. What about this circumstance? What about that? Don't be a slave to fear. That's... Uh, what worldly culture does. It infuses you with this thing that, oh, if you trust this God in this area, that's not very wise. This might happen and that and this and this. All these negative things. But the problem with that thinking is <clears throat> many of those things won't happen. And those that do happen, guess what? God will work all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. He will actually build you up. He will use Satan's attack against your faith to strengthen your perseverance, your reliance upon God. You'll be able to hear him better. You'll be stronger. You'll have more understanding. And when you get to the end of your wilderness experience, you will break out and establish the kingdom and begin to rout enemy forces out of other people's lives. You see, God is not just thinking about you. He's thinking about how ungodly culture has crept into everyone's life and He wants to use you, a mighty warrior of God, to help set the captives free. That's why Jesus died to set the captives free. And if we'll launch out in faith like the mighty warriors where <laughs> the least of these will be mightier than David, that's what God is doing. What kind of faith will you walk in? Because God cannot be stopped if you'll just have faith in Him. God can't be stopped. Satan doesn't want to get in a direct head-to-head -head altercation with God because <laughs> uh, there's not much of a competition there. You see, the blood of Jesus is paid. In the courts of heaven, the blood of Jesus speaks louder 
than anything else. You need to get that in your spirit. The blood of Jesus says, you have been bought with a price. And the accuser can say, no, 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 why, they've done bad. And the blood says, that's paid for, shut up, boy. You need to understand. The blood of Jesus bought something for you, but you have to take some steps of faith to make what God has purchased for you come to pass. He's looking for partnership. He's done all the heavy lifting, but he wants your participation. And so in that moment that comes there where you want to turn back, I encourage you to break through. Keep your eyes upon Jesus and upon the promise that God gave you. Do not allow Satan to steal your promise, but break through and establish the kingdom. When that report comes that says, oh, there's giants in the land, say, I don't care. None of them are bigger than my God. You see? We're walking out of dead religious culture and walking into faith. Faith moves mountains. And that's what God is doing in your life. Teaching you to walk by faith and not by sight. I want to pray for you. So Father, I ask you to Give the people courage in going through the wilderness and knowing you are with them every step of the way. <laughs> you are their vanguard and rear guard, Lord. That's what you do for us. You never leave us or forsake us. And when we think, oh, there's nothing to eat, there's nothing to drink, <laughs> you provide. You provide water from the rock. You provide the bread from heaven. You are our provider. And we need to learn to listen to you in all things. And to take your word and not just read about the things that happen to other people, but to begin to take it and apply it to our own lives so that your spirit propels us forward to fulfill your purposes in the earth. I thank you, God, for doing this. I bless you all. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I encourage you to check out my new book, The Power Cycle of Creation, A Wheel-Driven Vehicle. This is a spiritual journey exploring the perspectives of God toward all of creation, Christian culture, mankind, and time itself. Go to SovereignRoar.com to learn more. On the website, you can also sign up to receive the Judah Watch monthly by email. This is an apostolic commentary on Christian culture and newsletter format. This has been an episode of the Paradigm Shift Weekly. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a new episode of the Paradigm Shift, a weekly video series produced by Sovereign Roar. Sovereign Roar is the apostolic marketplace ministry of Matthew Shoemaker.